On this June 27, 2023 edition of What the Ship, our 100,000 subscriber edition. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we were a week off with doing our weekly show, What the Ship. We do a kind of a 20, 30 minute episode where we recap the top five stories in the news. Didn't do that last week because of everything that was happening with the loss of the submersible Titan. Myself, I got pulled in to do a lot of news hits and briefings and get on, you name it. I, I've been on way too much media. I'm not going to lie. No one needs to see this face on a common Basis. Although I am very happy that today I was able to get a op-ed published in the New York Times talking about why we need to continue with the use of submersibles. I'll have a link in the show notes so that you can head over there. But this week we're back. We're back. And the first thing I want to do is thank everybody who subscribes to this channel. We went over 100,000 subscribers over the last week. I'm going to do a special episode recapping that. But I just want to, again, thank everybody who subscribes to this channel, who tunes in. We are back on format. We're going to be talking about what goes on in global shipping and global news. And so that's what we're hitting this week with our five stories. Before we jump into it, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. So while the media has been focused on five people who paid uh, $250,000 to go down in a submersible down the Titanic, around the world there were maritime disasters happening on a common basis. And one of them, I'm going to feature actually two of them right now, is this one. This is a story from Reuters back in June 16th about a migrant vessel loaded down with Pakistanis that was sunk off the coast of Greece. And this is something we are seeing quite a bit. Uh, this comes out from the UN High Commissioner's Office talking about how uh, smugglers and human traffickers uh, were moving these vessels and at least 78 people were lost in the shipwreck off the coast of Greece. That number has since gone up. Witnesses suggest between 400 and 750 people were packed on a fishing boat that went down Wednesday before last. What happened on Wednesday underscores the need to investigate people smuggling and human traffickers and ensure they are brought to justice. The High Commissioner reiterated his calls to states to open up more regular migration channels and enhance responsibility sharing, ensure arrangements for the safe and timely disembarkation of all people rescued at sea, and the establishment of independent monitoring and oversight of migration-related policies and practices. So one of the things we're seeing in the Mediterranean in particularly is a lot of migrants traveling illegally from North Africa, from the Levant, that's the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, into what is the European Union today. And this has been going on repeatedly. There's a, a stat from the United Nations that over 20,000 people have died or disappeared in the central Mediterranean uh, since 2014. And that nearly 3,800 people have died on migration routes from the Middle East and North Africa last year. This has to do with issues in the Middle East and just a, the situation there. People are trying to get out for a better life and people will do that all the time. But losses at sea in particular should bring us note because this is a big concern. People are getting on boats, way overpacking them, and they're being lost. And there needs to be some sort of control over that. There is an international patrol that's being done largely by European nations in the Mediterranean. But you have to render assistance when vessels are in distress. And these ships are so overloaded, they are. The other example here of vessels is this in the Philippines, where a ferry, which is a very common one, fortunately, we see in the Philippines, uh, caught fire. 120 people rescued from a Philippine ferry fire. This is back on June 18th. All 120 people on board the ferry caught fire at sea in central Philippines on Sunday have been rescued, the Coast Guard said. The MV Esperanza Star, which was carrying 65 passengers and 55 officers and crew, caught fire while sailing from Sequahor Island in the south near Bolo Island, the Coast Guard said. Now, this is very common in the Philippines, largely because ferries are so commonplace in the Philippines. You've got over 7,500 islands that make up the Philippines. Uh, we have seen a lot of disasters like this. Back in March, a ferry carrying 250 people caught fire in the southern Philippines, and that led to the death of more than two dozen. And one of the greatest disasters of all ferry fires took place in the Philippines need to ensure that safety standards are in place 
especially on something like ferries. Uh, people board ferries all the time in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East, around the world. That is commonplace in the United States, but you do see them. But these ferries in particular are going over longer distances and the threat of fire, of sinking is always present. And while we have focused so much on five people who have lost their lives tragically on board the Titan, we shouldn't forget that there are disasters happening around the world almost on a daily basis regarding ships. Now, shipping has gotten much more safer. Uh, a report uh, that just this year cited that the loss of ships, sunk ships, is actually continuing going down over the past 10 years. That does not mean that there still isn't danger out there. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number two. Story number two, I'm going to run you around the, the, the shipping sectors. What's the latest going on in each of the major sectors that we have? So we'll start off here on containers. Story over GCAP Mike Schuller. UNCTAD, this is the UN uh, Conference on Trade. Positive start, pessimistic outlook for global trade in 2023. And uh, UNCTAD does their yearly report. This is something I reference all the time, the Review of Maritime Transport. I think it is the Bible of documents. As a matter of fact, I recently received a actual paper copy of it, of the review of maritime transport, and even, I'm not going to lie you, a signed autograph by Jan Hoffman, who uh, helps write it. I've, uh, th this goes up on the shelf in a place of honor in what's going on with shipping office. However, UNCTAD is really predicting that trade may see a little bit less rise than we thought. Overall, the outlook for global trade in the second half of 2023 is pessimistic as negative factors dominate the positive. According to the report, trade in goods increased 1.9% in the first quarter of 2023, adding $100 billion, while global services trade increased 2.8%. It goes on here, the UNCTAD report notes a rise in friend shoring and a decline in diversification of trade partners. And I think that's really the big issue. A lot of people are re onshoring goods. They're not doing as much international trade, but international trade is still a major factor. So UNCTAD talking about growth, but not as much as hoped for in the past. Continuing on here, liner bear market looms as rates continue to tumble. This is from Mike Wackett over at Lodestar. Great source if you don't follow Lodestar. Absolutely stellar on containers. Maritime analysts are looking bearish on the outlook for liner shipping as industry destocking progress in the U.S. and Europe disappoints. Uh, talks about it here. The global macroeconomic environment is still far more favorable with significant monetary tightening continuing, which we predict will lead to recessions in Europe and the U.S. Not good. If you go down here, Zentia's XSI Asia North Europe component shed a further 5.5% for an average of $1,240 per 40-foot container. This compares with a reading in the same week of last year of 10,353. Now, again, Comparing to last year is a bad comparison, in my opinion, because the market was so out of whack last year. But one of the things we've seen is that that Asia to Northern Europe market has been really good. It's been really uh, maintaining its value during this period. In other words, it hadn't come down as low as Trans-Pacific, but now we're starting to see that come down. And of course, that has indications for trade softening. And remember, we're talking about containers here. Go over here to Greg Miller over at Freightways. Always a great uh, read, Greg. Container shipping divide. Cargo rates weaken. Ship rents robust. And this is referring to NO NOOs. This is talk talking about non-owner operators. Basically those who lease vessels and operate them out there. So while liner demand is, is up for lease ships and they're staying high, we're seeing freight rates falter. And if you want, and again, I'll have all these in the show notes, Greg always does a great job here of really giving you the data so that you can look at where the freight rates are, the indices are happening. And one of the things you're seeing here is that little bit of decline that we're seeing across the board. Moving on here, another story from G Captain. MSC is bleeding the charter market dry. Mediterranean Shipping Company is the behemoth of shipping companies now. They have surpassed Maersk. Maersk is actually in danger of falling to third place. Uh, CMA CGM is talking about uh, overseeing, the, uh, getting past them, the Sarda family. 
But this story also by Mike Wackett, really good one because it's talking about how MSC has been buying ships like crazy. If you have a container ship, MSC will buy them from you. So MSC has bought more than 300 used container ships since August of 2020. They are just on a market to buy container ships. And what they're doing is really controlling the marketplace in many ways. And we're seeing this, uh, putting them really less dependent on those NOOs. That other story talked about how NOOs are making great money leasing vessels. Maris, I mean, excuse me, uh, MSC is getting away from that. They have it. And this is going to actually be a big advantage for them as the market slows down. They're going to be able to bleed a lot of that traffic, get rid of it and sell it for scrap. And so I think MSC is running a very unique type of shipping organization right now. It's going to be interesting to watch how they fare here. At the same time, you have a story like this over at Splash 24-7. Ada's agent put this out. Scorpio Tankers fixes $1 billion of financing for 45 ships. So we've seen building in the container sector like crazy because they're flush with money. Well, typically you build when you have money. Well, here the tanker market has money now in some sectors, and we're seeing investment in tankers, which is really desperate. We really need new tankers out in that sector. Finally, this uh, story we have here, flotilla of Saudi oil tankers near the Suez shrinks a little bit. So Saudis have been sitting on oil. We know that. OPEC has cut down on their production. And then at one point last week, there was about nine Saudi and two Chinese super tankers that were anchored uh, off the port, uh, off a port in Egypt, just sitting there waiting. Now, this happens a lot, believe it or not. Tankers load oil, they sit there, and they wait for where the market has the best return. It's better than sailing around, dumping it, and then going back empty. They would much rather sit, hold, and go to a place where they can sell it. And so when you have VLCCs loaded with 2 million barrels of oil, oil is a, a barrel, is 42 gallons, they're going to sit there and really want to figure out where they're going. So you were talking about maybe up to 22 million barrels sitting there waiting to go at one point. It's, it's uh, a really interesting story, and we're seeing that fleet now diminished. Then you go over to the, the bulk sector, and we've got two issues going on with the bulk sector. One of them is this. If grain deal ends, the U.N. pledge on Russian exports will go on, according to a Russian official. So the bulk trade, the movement of grain around the world, we have seen that the grain coming out of Ukraine has slowed down quite a bit. And a lot of issues about the Russians pulling out. Will the grain deal continue or not? Uh this UN pledge that Russian exports will go on is trying to get the Russians to agree to continue the, the, the Ukrainian exports. Part of the deal is that there is no impediment to the Russian export of food and fertilizer. Fuel is being inter interfered with in that there's a price cap, but they've never come close to the price cap. So the UN is sitting there saying, listen, we are not going to interfere. So even if the UN grain deal ends, Russian food and fertilizer can come out. This is an attempt to get them going. And then you have this story also by Greg Miller over at Freight Waves. How could sooner than expected Russian defeat impact shipping? So again, what happens if Russia ends the war in Ukraine, pulls out? What's going to go on? What is the deal for this? I'm going to do a separate video on this because this is a really, really interesting story. I think Greg is on to something big. What is the impact of Russia pulling out of the Ukraine when you had that coup or uprising, whatever it is, and the Russian uh, um, uh, uh, forces, not the Russian forces, the Wagner forces, the mercenaries grab Rostov on Don. That was key. That was not just the headquarters for the Russian forces in Ukraine. That's the terminus port. That's the New Orleans of Russia, where the Don, the Caspian, the Volga all dump out. And holding that city was really key, and it really scared the Russians. All right, let's go ahead and jump on over to story number three. Story number three deals with two treaties that are going to impact uh, shipping on the high seas. The very first one, Bangladesh and Liberia trigger the Hong Kong Conventory for entry into force. This deals with ship breaking. So for more than 14 years, the IMO, which had adopted what's called the Hong Kong International Convention for the Safe and Environmentally Sound Recycling of Ships Convention has been out there. And now with Bangladesh and Liberia ratifying it, it is now coming into force. And within two years, 24 months, this convention will go into place. 
And what it does is it basically adopts a very comprehensive, what they call cradle to grave approach that addresses all environmental and safety aspects relating to ship recycling scrapping, including responsible management and disposal of associated waste streams in a safe and environmentally sound manner. The three biggest countries that scrap ships are Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and then Turkey in the distant fourth. But those three countries have been doing scrapping for a long time, and there's been a lot of pollution and um, contamination in those areas. And so there was a push to really ratify so that, <coughs> excuse me, that we can clean up ship cycling. And basically there's a responsibility from the construction of a ship to the recycling. So just because uh, you build the ship doesn't mean you're not out from it. So this is designed to ensure that there are methods in place to ensure the safe recycling of a ship. And the recycling is the term they want to use because a lot of a ship is reused. Again, the steel machinery equipment is reused. And ships are designed today with shorter uh, service lives. Back in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, you can build a ship for 30, 40 years, not anymore. They're basically good for about 15 to 25 years tops. And then that's it. And you've got to recycle. And the idea here is to keep the technology fresh. And then this story, UN adopts landmark high seas treaty. This is Mike Schuller over at G Captain. After nearly two decades of negotiations, the UN's 193 member states adopted a legally binding marine biodiversity agreement covering two thirds of the planet's oceans, aiming to create a wave of conservation known as the High Seas Treaty. The agreement aims to protect the marine environment, maintain the integrity of the ocean ecosystem, and conserve marine biological diversity. It also addresses issues such as plastic pollution, overfishing, and climate change, and recognizes the rights and the traditional knowledge of in ind indigenous peoples and local communities. The big issue here is that for years, and I sailed in the 80s and 90s, we dumped a batch of crap in the ocean. We really did. I mean, the U.S. government dumped nuclear waste in the ocean in the 50s and 60s. We dumped stuff in the ocean all the time. Uh, back in the heydays, New York had uh, barges loaded with trash that went out to a spot uh, called the canyon and, and you know where the continental shelf had this rift and the barges would go out loaded with New York City garbage and just the bottom opens up and the garbage dumps and not all of it sunk. So we've been dumping stuff in the ocean for a long time. And now there's a more kind of meat in this to ensure that we're doing a better job. The oceans are getting warmer. That's true. I mean, we, we have the proof on that. And so we need to be better uh, custodians of the ocean. I think this is a big part of it. All right, let's go ahead and head over to story number four. Story number four is one we cover a lot on this channel is what's going on with water in inland water systems. Bloomberg had this story the other day. Summer just started, but the Rhine River is already starting to dry up. We're seeing that across the board. We've had repeated stories about that with the Mississippi River and the upper Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri River area. But here we're seeing that play out right now in Europe. And understand the drying up of the Rhine is really critical. A lot of trade in Europe moves by river and barge traffic because of the, of the geography of Europe. It's basically a long peninsula with a center mountain spine. And so you have all these rivers that dump out. And so rivers are basically highways into Europe. And when you start seeing the fall of rivers, it impacts trade greatly. This is a big issue because the Rhine feeds not just into the Rhine River and to the North Sea, but you're talking about the Mon and you're talking about the Danube uh, canal system that connects Rotterdam all the way to the Black Sea. So this has a big issue. And one of the big pieces of good news came out was this story here. Panama Canal postpones draft restrictions after much needed rain. So the Panama Canal had been predicting no rain because of this El Nino effect. However, it did get some rain, which is really, really good. That rain dumped into the Panama Canal. They were talking about reducing the draft. Now, draft has been reduced. Typically, 50 feet is the draft restriction to go into the new lane of the Panama Canal, what's called Neo Panamax. But now they're set to continue sailing at a draft of 44 feet. 
and Panamax ships can move at 39.5 feet, the Canal Authority said. That's really big because they were talking about reducing that even more. And every half foot they remove off a vessel is thousands of tons of cargo, meaning less cargo was going to be able to transit the canal and head to the east and Gulf Coast. That was really paramount with the ILWU and PMA when they were having their contract renegotiations. We have an agreement. We had a whole video on that. We had smoke coming out from the meeting at San Francisco. But now we're waiting for that agreement to go to all the locals, the 29 ports, for ratification. So we'll see what happens. But this is good news about the Panama Canal, but it's not out of the woods yet. This relief is good for now, but we're not at max draft yet. And so this is the period where Panama should be getting the rains, and it's just not getting it right now in sufficient quantities. All right, let's go to our last story. So my last story deals with Titan and Titanic. I know that some of you may be tired of hearing this story, but this is a different Titan. And one of the things that strikes me, again, my background is beyond being a former merchant mariner, is I'm a maritime historian. I got my master's in maritime history and nautical archeology, span and then a PhD in military and naval history. And I'm always struck by how many times, at least in the maritime sector, we can predict what's gonna happen. So for the past week, have talked a lot about the fact that many people foresaw the disaster that was coming with Titan. James Cameron has been out there everywhere talking about this. And one of the problems I have with this story is that if, if so many people knew this submersible was such a problem, then why couldn't we do more about it? They went to the owner, the CEO, Stockton Rush, but obviously that wasn't enough. But that wasn't going anywhere. And lots of times we in the maritime industry can foresee a disaster before it happens. And that's why I bring you this, the story of the Titan and the Titanic. So this is a story uh, back in September of 2017 by Katie Serena. And I'll have this uh, in, the, in the show notes for you. The wreck of the Titan told of the Titanic sinking 14 years before it happened. And this author, Morgan Robertson, wrote a story entitled The Wreck of the Titan or Futility. And in his story, he tells of a tale of a cruise ship, 800 feet long, 45,000 tons, sailing from England to the United States on a cool April night. Uh, they had about 2,500 passengers on board when moving through the ocean at 25 knots. They struck an iceberg on the starboard side, 400 nautical miles from Newfoundland. Newfoundland. The ship sank quickly, and due to insufficient number of lifeboats, it took a majority of the passengers with them. If the story sounds familiar, he wrote this in 1898, 14 years before Titanic sank. He got the location almost exactly right. He got the iceberg hitting the right side of the vessel, which makes sense because icebergs come from up north coming south. So it would hit on the starboard side for a ship going from England to Europe. But the prediction is absolutely eerie. Now, there's, there's, there, there's some differences here. Nearly everybody dies in this wreck. I think there's like 17 survivors on it. There, there's an instance where one of the survivors gets on the iceberg and has to battle a polar bear that somehow rode the iceberg down. So it's not exactly perfect, but the story is, is uncanny. It really is. And again, the story, the title of it is The Wreck of the Titan or Futility. The name of the ship he uses is Titan. So he actually accurately predicts Titanic as the name later on, and then Titan, the name of the submersible, over a hundred years later. And I, I'm always taken away by how much we can really foresee a lot of disasters. Everybody kind of foresaw that using a new technology, a new type of material could bring disaster to Titan, Ocean Gate, and the people who are on board. However, I have to say that if you go back and look at the history of maritime shipping, new technologies are always greeted with skepticism, whether it's steam power, whether it's containers, uh, you name it. Every time there's a new technology that's out there, there's hesitation. People don't want to adopt it. And most of the time, it the experience is there's disaster. You know, A lot of maritime law is written in the blood of victims from accidents. And unfortunately, it seems that might be the case here. When Titanic sank in 1912, two years later, we got the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, SOLAS, which was great because then you had all the requirements to ensure that Titanic would not 
uh, go down again without enough lifeboats, without distress signals, without 24 hour monitoring. There's fascination with Titanic. I got a freaking Titanic Lego back there that I'm building. I'm, I'm, I'm only a third of the way done with the thing. Got it for Christmas. So I, I actually just have it there because it, it just happens to be where it's at. I've been building the thing now since Christmas, uh, my son and I. And so Titanic is a fascination that people have with it. And I think when we foresee problems, a lot of people will sit there and say, why didn't you do something? What can you do? Well, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to tell people that this is going to happen. If somebody had told you on September 10th, 2001, people would fly airplanes into the Twin Towers, you would not believe them. And for Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate, he firmly believed that his submersible was safe or else he would not be in the pilot seat taking it down. And I, I think we have to learn from that. My op-ed talks about that. We just need to keep continuing on. We need to learn lessons and move forward and not sit there and say, we're never going to do this again because, you know, people kept crossing the Atlantic after Titanic sank. People still get on cruise ships after Casa Concordia. Uh, we've lost container ships on fire and, and sunk to the bottom of the ocean, but we still keep shipping things in containers. Uh, we're going to keep doing things. We've had a, a ocean, uh, we had Exxon Valdez. We still move oil by tankers. So we're going to keep going. And I think that's one of the resiliencies we see in maritime shipping. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We're back. We're back on schedule. We're going to do be doing our weekly show, What the Ship, and then a couple of videos during the week focusing on key topics. And as I mentioned before, I've got interviews coming up with a couple of key people. We've got a couple of great topic stories we're going to be having. So if you're new to the channel, hey, hit that button and subscribe. Hit the bell button so you'll be alerted when new videos come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that, Sal? Well, you hit the super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link in the show notes or pop up over here. I think it's over here. Uh, you'll see it pop up and you can go ahead and become a monthly or yearly patron. I want to thank all my patrons, all my subscribers. We are well over 100,000 subscribers now and growing. And it's just been uh, an amazing two years and four months. Started this back in March of 2021 when Ever Given went sideways in the Suez. And we have kept going ever since. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.